Lord, we are thankful for your goodness to us. And we thank you that each day your mercies are new to us. And I pray uh, now for these men and women that will hear uh, the word of God and see uh, the lecture notes as well as the uh, textbook. God, I pray that all of these things will be giving them information, giving them equipment to do the work of the ministry. Lord, we do pray that you would give us insight and illumination to your word. Let us continue to grow in knowing you. And we pray as we look at this great doctrine of soteriology, that it will rejoice our hearts once again, that it'll cause us to want to worship you more and to serve you better. And so I pray uh, your blessing and grace upon each one of these men and these women that will be listening, that God, you will give them abundant grace, uh, not only for the pardon of sin, but the empowerment to live pleasing to you and to serve you uh, effectively. And so we pray for these next two hours that they will further your kingdom. They will bring honor to your son. And we just thank you that we today have another life day, a day to serve you anew. I pray for them as they go into their evening that they will finish well this day and be able to look into your face uh, spiritually in their hearts and minds and see your smile and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant today. So, Lord, we want to please you, and we ask this class would be used uh, to give you pleasure and us the joy of serving you better. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to go to, I've got something up on my screen I've got to remove uh, here just a second. So, but I just wanted to uh, say I'm glad to have the opportunity to take these some 26 hours and share the word of God with you. Uh, the way we will structure this class today and the other classes will be, I'll start, I'll give some lecture, and then We'll have questions and answers about into 40, 45 minutes into the lesson. So if you have any questions, we'll save them for that time. We'll answer those questions, then we'll have a, a short break and we'll come back in five or seven minutes and uh, then finish out the two hours. And I think, uh, did uh, Brother Victor, did you give all of the, uh, Men, uh, the schedule that I sent out uh, on this uh, Soteriod's class, uh, how we're going to approach it, the assignment sheet. Yeah. Is that? Do, yeah. do they have that? Yes, yes. We have series Good. for everyone that you have sent to me. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure you all had it because we're going to look at it right now and just go over some things. Uh, we start out with the introductory statement, the study of viable salvation is what soteriology really is, the doctrine of salvation. And that comes from that Greek word uh, where we get soteriology. And so we're going to give Bible information, hopefully give you personal inspiration and a practical application each time we look at different things concerning soteriology or salvation. We will seek the Holy Spirit to give us insight or illumination. So we'll see things clearly. Oftentimes we'll use illustrations to do that. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said that illustrations are like windows in a building where there's no light, but if you have windows, you can open the curtains and the light comes in and you can see clearly the things that are inside that room or in that building 
by the windows, allowing light to come in. And that's exactly what Jesus did with parables. And what we do with illustrations or what would be called parables in the New Testament time. Uh, 2 Timothy 3 says, uh, basically what we want to look at here is Paul writing to Timothy in his last epistle to Timothy, the second epistle. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, and I hope you have your Bibles out there, because we're going to be referring a lot to scripture references here in our first study. But if you look at that section in 2 Timothy, he says, from a child, you have known the scriptures, basically is what he's saying, that have made you wise unto salvation. Now, where did Timothy get that? His mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois, uh, were his mother and grand grandmother. And it says, and from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. And it says in that statement, which make you or you or thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So he talks about the scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and whenever that term man of God is used in the Old Testament, it's usually referring to a prophet or a spokesman for God. And so it says that the man of God may be thoroughly or completely equipped for the work of the ministry. And so he's going to be thoroughly furnished unto all good works and uh, his personal life and his ministry. So that's really going to be our theme, the scriptures making us wise unto salvation. The assignment sheet, I just want to give you four things here to really focus on primarily the textbook. I have a copy of your textbook right here. If you, you don't see any uh, thing on it because I've got it covered. I have this since 1970. This one, it's a 1969 uh, edition of what was originally written in 1949. This is what I call a classic systematic theology book. Now, it's not the only one that I have. I have basic theology that you can do extra credit by Charles Ryrie in that. Uh, Burkhoff's uh, Doctrines book, yes, I have that. I have Erickson's Theology book. But this, this to me is the best overall biblical balance systematic theology book. And it, but we're going to have you read the Bible reading as well as textbook. The Bible reading and quoting we'll do is out of the King James Version. And th these passages of Scripture, I would like you to read through these passages of Scriptures. If you can do it in the next three weeks, that would be great in, when we have our next class. But by the end of the semester of this class, I'm going to ask you, have you read all of these passages? Now, you can, some of you know Greek, and if some of you know Hebrew, and if you want to study them in that as well, uh, I personally was a Greek minor. I had 30 hours of undergraduate degree, dr Greek. Uh, Victor loves Greek. I know that, and some of you have Greek as well, and that'll give you insight. We'll make reference to Greek and Hebrew words and their meanings. But the introductory lectures in Systematic Theology by Thiessen, there are these pages that are 274 to 397 that we're going to be covering under the topic of soteriology in that book. Now, today we're going to be looking primarily in our definitions at 363 to 384. So if you start reading in that, and by the way, you get a free download on PDF format on that. And so you, it's not going to cost you anything if you want an electronic version of it. Uh, that's a real blessing that you don't have to pay for it. Uh, but you can get a hard copy if you want to order that. 
I'm going to be referring to out of a hard copy whenever we're uh, studying, but the verses of scripture and the thoughts that we're going to refer to in the next couple of classes is 274 to uh, 397 in that bracket, but particularly 363 to 384. And then when reading your Bible, here's, a, here's an outline I want to give you, and you want to write this down or note it. I hope you have a piece of paper and a pencil, but when you're reading your Bible and textbook assignments, look for terms or words that are related to biblical soteriology, because we're going to take those terms and those words and fill in more information in our class lectures. Note their definitions. For example, we're going to look at justification today. Do you have a clear and a concise, comprehensive definition of uh, justification? And then note, not only get yourself definitions, get illustrations that would make clear or give understanding to you and to those you teach uh, what justification really is. Bible illustrations or homespun illustrations. And then the applications of these salvation terms. How does this apply to a person's life? How do you embrace this by faith and live it by faith is really what you want to look at. And then times and dates of classes. Your time is 6 p.m. on Friday evenings. And uh, it's 8.30 in the morning here where I'm going to be teaching you. So it'll be 6 p.m. And there are the dates that our classes are scheduled. Unless some kind of emergency or unforeseen thing comes, this will be the days that we have lecture. And that will be today, July the 1st. Our next class is July the 22nd. And let me just ask prayer for these next three weeks for me. Uh, one of the reasons we're going to wait off on this is I'm headed to Canada next week. And I would appreciate your prayers. I'm going to be there to preach uh, Wednesday through Saturday next week for a family camp that I've been to maybe 13 or 14 times ministering at this Christian camp in Nova Scotia, Canada. Then uh, I'll be back on the 20th and we'll start up on that Friday, the 22nd again. But nine days that I'm going to be gone, I'm going to be at a church that's without a pastor, and I'm going to be holding a Bible conference there uh, from a Sunday to a Sunday. Uh, most of those days I'll be preaching, so there'll be nine messages that I preach at that Bible conference, and I would appreciate your prayers for that ministry. But then as you look through August, we have three dates, five Fridays in September and October, two lectured classes, 7th and 14th, and then we'll have a final exam. Now, let me just say this. We don't have any papers or writing of essays that are be required for this class since it's a online distance learning uh, class. And let me just give you this perspective too. In your test that we're going to have, and we're going to have three tests uh, during this semester or these 26 hours, and they're going to have questions, and there'll be 200 questions basically that will be total for the whole semester. They're going to be true false questions, multiple choice questions or matching questions. Now, I'll do a lot of matching or scripture references that I'll emphasize to you. Matching of definitions, matching uh, like justification. That has to do with a pardon, and it has to do with a placement of righteousness. And so I might put a phrase down, uh, imputation of righteousness. And uh, that would clue you that that means this is defining justification. There might be a passage that I say, for example, 
the three tenses of salvation, which are justification, sanctification, and glorification. And you'll need to know that that's Titus 2, verses 11 through 13, and I will emphasize that to you. I'm, I'm a person that think you need to know biblical references. You need to have a good, thorough uh, referencing ability so you can point people to the scripture uh, when you're witnessing to them or teaching them or counseling them. And then uh, those test questions will be taken from your lecture notes. And you have three pages of that that I've sent to Brother Victor to send to you. And those were mainly words with definitions and, and some comments with verse references. And the textbook, I will emphasize passages you need to know for your next exam. And then the Bible reading, I'll be making references in the Bible reading and I'll note certain things that I say, you need to remember this. Okay, a test will be given on August 19th, September 16th, and that will cover the previous four lectures. And then a final exam will be given either October 21st through the 28th, and it will cover four weeks that we've just completed of September and into October. And also some questions from the whole semester. So you don't want to forget what you had on the first three, um, I mean, first four weeks test or the second four weeks test. You want to remember them all. Extra credit, Charles Ryrie's book, Basic Theology. If you read 60 pages of Basic Theology, uh, you'll get five extra points uh, out of uh, what we would say are the basic 200 points, you could get 205 points if you get all the questions right on the test and read 60 pages. If you read the whole section that I have listed here of 201 to 335, 124 pages, you'll get 10 extra credit points. This will give you some additional equipment and information. We use a 10 per point grading scale, 90 to 100 percent is an A for the course 80 to 89, and that's the typical thing. Any questions you might have? And by the way, we're going to go through terms. Uh, I have, besides the terms you have listed here, these 16 terms, I have on a, the sheet of paper I have in my hand probably another 30 to 35 listed that we're going to be covering. Any questions about the assignment sheet? Okay. Well, I'm glad that's so clear. Uh, and uh, if you have questions in the future, let me know. Uh, we will probably do this. Uh, we'll probably take the test at the end of a class period and uh, let it be graded, but we'll we'll figure that out in the future. Now, if you want to turn, all of you have your three pages of uh, words with definitions. Have you got that with you there? Okay. Uh, then that's where we're going to go to now, and we're going to start up our lectures. Uh, once again, we will stop in about thirty minutes or so and have questions and answers. And then uh, we'll have a break time and for about five minutes, and then we'll go back to the last hour. My master's in the, the graduate study level was in theology. Uh, I personally enjoyed systematic theology in undergraduate class at Bob Jones University. And when I was doing my Master's of Arts degree, it was a Master's of Arts in Theology. Uh, I think that particular study was excellent for preparation to be a pastor, uh, teacher of uh, the Word of God. 
And we're in one that a lot of people think that soteriology is just a very simple study. Sure, it has to do with our salvation. That's wonderful. But there's a depth in this and a riches and wealth that just should thrill our souls as believers and ministers. And I trust through this course that your soul is going to be just uh, rejoicing, glad for what we see um, more as the scripture comes alive to us. And I want to just say that it, soteriology is the doctrine or study of salvation. Soteria is the Greek word. And whenever we look at this, I want to give you five steps to approach of studying any passage of scripture. Back in the 1970s, the early 1970s, someone showed me a systematic way to explain clearly a verse or a passage of scripture to people you're witnessing to and trying to share the gospel of Christ for their salvation. And when I heard that, I thought that's a very organized, orderly way to make the scripture clear to someone. And so the, if you would put down on your piece of paper, number one, read the passage of scripture or the verse. For example, if you were going to witness to someone out of Romans, the Romans road is very familiar to many of us. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and has come short of the glory of God. So read it. Now, if the person is literate and they can read, I like to have them read out loud if I'm witnessing to someone. Let them read the verse out loud. They're seeing it they're speaking it, and they're hearing it, that will cause them to be able to remember it better. Anything that we repeat verbally that we look at stays with us longer. That's why whenever memorizing scripture, I think it's good you're trying to re maybe memorize a phrase of a whole verse, repeating it out loud over and over again, even pacing back and forth, makes it easier to memorize. But read the passage of scripture or the verse. And so I do this even with my devotions. I do this whenever I teach a Sunday school class. I do this when I preach. I read the passage. And then second, put down number two, define or give definitions of any unclear words. Okay, and so you want to write this down because you're going to see this on a test in the future. All right, these five points I'm giving to you are going to be seen again. And so you want to define any words that a person might not understand. Now, when I went to Bob Jones University as a freshman to study for the ministry, I'd only been in church growing in the Lord about nine or 10 months. And I didn't know a lot of meanings of words, particularly theological words in the Bible. I had no exposure to the Bible like that. So what I did is I learned I've got, as I'm reading my Bible reading personally for devotions, I needed to have a dictionary. Now, today you can have your phone and you can look it up on Google, uh, you know, Wikipedia's definition or whatever. But I had Webster's dictionary. Well, Webster was a Christian, and if you see the word salvation, he would give you a secular meaning that would simply mean rescued or delivered, but then he would give you the sacred or biblical meaning, which had to do with being saved or rescued from sin or the penalty of sin, okay? So give definitions, of maybe theological words or unclear words that your people you're teaching do not have a clear, concise uh, definition. Third, give them a illustration that will give them insight. I'll give you an example of Jesus uh, whenever he was teaching, and he was actually saying this in his 
high priestly prayer in John 17 and verse 3. He said, and this is life eternal. Now, when you see the word is, that means equal or a definition is coming. And he said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So right there, Jesus gave a definition of eternal life. The core and heart of eternal life is knowing God the Father and knowing his Son personally and intimately. That word for know is gnosis, and it has the idea of knowing someone experientially in an accumulated, growing way. Okay? And Victor's smiling because he knows that word, but it is it has to do with knowing someone intimately and personally. It's what God says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. That word knowledge is gnosis, and it means get to know your wife experientially, personally, and intimately, so you understand her as a woman, as a wife, and as an individual. And he says, then live with her according to how you get to know her intimately and personally. Okay, well, Jesus was saying that's the heart of eternal life. Sometimes people eternal life think is, well, that's living somewhere forever, but everybody's going to live somewhere forever, okay? So some people are going to live in hell forever, and then others are going to live in heaven forever. So it's not just living forever. There's eternal death, and there's eternal life. So eternal life has to do with knowing God personally in a growing way. So when I read my Bible, and I remember the first time when I looked at John 17, 3, and I, it struck me, knowing and God and growing and knowing God is eternal life. I'm experiencing eternal life right now. I'm reading the Bible. I'm getting to know him better. Well, the, uh, an illustration, Jesus would use parables or illustrations, but I'm going to go back to our Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, okay? We oftentimes just kind of read over those things, but what does it mean all? Well, in the context, it all means Gentiles and Jews, all human beings, sinned, if you look at the Greek word for that, harmartia, it has to do with falling short, missing the mark, missing the goal, okay? And the glory of God there, that a definition for the glory of God, you know, that could be bright, shining lights in the clouds. That's glorious, no? He's talking about the sinless perfection of God compared to our sinfulness, and so you give definitions like that. And then after you read the passage, you give definitions, you get an illustration. And the illustration I use for that verse uh, is this. Bow and arrow. Uh, recently, we went to get my 13-year-old grandson. And in the front of their house, he had a box set up and he was shooting an arrow into that box as a target with a bow you know what a bow and an arrow is you know uh, like the israelites fighting in military battle shooting arrows and we remember the king got shot right in the back by an arrow that was just shot up in the to the crowd and he got hit in the back and it killed him well when I illustrate that, I say to people, I'm going to set a target or a box or with a bullseye on it over here on this part of the city, maybe three kilometers away. Okay. And then I'm going to come back here and I'm going to give you a bow and I want you to shoot that target over there three kilometers away. And they'll look at you and say, you're crazy. <laughs> that bow won't shoot that far. It'll never make it. If I shoot it, lift it up and let that arrow go as far as it'll go, it'll probably shoot down the street and hit somebody in the chest and kill them. But it'll never get to that target. You 
you took me and showed me where the target is, but that's too far. It's going to fall short of it. And that's what I tell people, no matter how hard you try to reach up to God's sinless perfection, his glory, you're going to fall short every time. You can't reach up to his perfect righteousness and holiness, sinless standard. So it, getting saved is not by your effort of being re sinless. We've all sinned and we're falling short of God's glory every day. And so that's the illustration I use. You know, 25 years ago, I had a man call me and said, are you the Tony Miller that, that used to come into my house in a Bible study in the 1970s? And I said, well, yeah, I, I was pastoring in the area you live in. He said, well, I, I want to just call you and tell you I was not saved at that time. But you gave an illustration in that Bible study I never forgot. It. Now, this is 20 some years after I'd given him that this illustration I just shared with you and said, you know, my wife was a Christian. She kept talking to me about the Lord, but I kept remembering that I fall short of God's glory. And I, not too long ago, I received Christ as my savior. And I just wanted to tell you that you had a part of that. And that illustration, I never forgot it, that I was sinning and falling short of God's glory all the time. So an illustration to give them insight. The fourth thing is after you read, you define, and you illustrate, is you apply. You make a personal application. And whenever I'm witnessing with Romans 3.23 to someone, I say to them, do you realize what this verse really means? It means me and it means you. We both are sinning all the time, coming short of God's glory, his sinless perfection. Do you realize that means you or I cannot save ourselves by trying to live perfectly up to God's standard, we're falling short and sinning. And I get them to apply that to them as I've applied it to myself. Okay, and they that settles it with them. And the last one is you want to not only give an application and apply it to them personally as you apply it also to yourself, the last one, point five, is you want to say, will you respond to this? You want to give them an invitation or invite them to apply the verse to their life or the passage of scripture or the truth to their life. So we have read, define, illustrate, apply, and also invite. Now, having said that, you're going to see me doing that with these terms quite often. The, pr the procedure I'm going to follow in my own personal devotions, my teaching, you know, I did that yesterday. Yesterday, I had my 13-year-old grandson uh, out at our house. I have two, by the way, I have three children and nine grandchildren, all right? Maybe I'd share that with you. My my wife is Jeanette, uh, and she's a multi talented lady, and I'm kind of a single talented person. All right, I'm not a multi talented. She's musical. She can sew. She can do everything. <laughs> uh, she makes. But me, I'm a basic sort of guy. I came out of a cultivator's farm life, you know. And so I, I'm not really fancy like my wife with all of her skills, but I have three children. I have a daughter, her and her husband spent five years in China doing outreach through teaching English as a second language. They have two sons. They now live back here in our area. The one son is 16, the other is 13. When the one was 16, I did a proverb study through the book of Proverbs with my 16 year old grandson. Now I just started with my 
13 year old grandson and I defined wisdom yesterday as it is in the book of Proverbs. I, I said, here what wisdom means. It's the best means to the best end. It's a very practical word, the Hebrew word hakma. And it means the best means to the best end in the best time. And that's what you want to be as a young man. You want to be a wise young man in every part of your life, doing the best means to the best end in everything, whether it's friends or finances or relationships with the opposite sex, you want to be wise, okay? And so I gave him a definition, and then I gave him some illustration, and through the book of Proverbs, we'll do that. Well, this is what I do, whether I'm teaching someone, or preaching, or studying, or having my own devotions. Now, salvation, we've got a term here that we're going to cover. Uh, salvation and we're thinking in terms primarily of old and new testament but the word for salvation in the old testament is seen in the names of three prophets joshua isaiah and hosea they all sound somewhat similar but these are forms of salvation from the hebrew word Jesus, Jesus, is the form in the New Testament of the Old Testament, Joshua, Isaiah, and Hosea. And so you remember the angel came to Mary and said to her, you're going to have a son. And then there's the instructions to Joseph, you're going to name this son that your espoused wife is going to be with child and bear a son and thou will call his name Jesus or he shall save his people from their sins. Now in the Old Testament, Joshua, Isaiah, Hosea means uh, basically Jehovah saves, Yahweh saves. Now I want to I want to just give you, and as I go along, I'm going to give you some, just some extra things. If you have a King James Bible that you're reading, you're going to see two times or two ways that the Hebrew word Yahweh is translated into our King James Bible. For whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is a quote from Joel 2.32. We see it in Romans 10.13. We see it in Acts 2 and verses 20, you know, and we so we see that uh, show up more than one time in the New Testament, quoting it. It's applied to Jesus as being Lord, that you're calling upon the name of the Lord. But notice in the Old Testament, Lord in Joel 2.32 is capitalized in every letter, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, okay? So that is actually Yahweh. Now, whenever you see uh, that, the Hebrew word in the Hebrew text is Yahweh. But whenever you see Lord in the Old Testament, just with a capital L, small O-R-D, that is translating Adonai, the Hebrew word Adonai. And that means master. Um, Adonai means a master, or an owner, a Lord. But Yahweh is referring to the self-existent personal God that enters into covenant relationship with Israel and in salvation relationships, okay? But it's the same Hebrew word. The, they just simply made different choices on how they were going to translate it. For example, Isaiah 43.10, you have Jehovah Witnesses over there that come two by two, and we have them in our country. And they will say, we're witnesses of Jehovah. And they take Isaiah 43 and verse 10, where it says, and ye shall be my witnesses. And it refers to Jehovah. So Yahweh is sometimes translated Jehovah. And sometimes it's 
Lord with all capital letters. Keep that in mind. Now you can prove to a Jehovah Witness that Jesus is also Jehovah, not only God the Father, because see, they don't believe that Jesus is deity or divine like God the Father. They only believe that God the Father is divine or God. But for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, or prepare ye the way of the Lord, that applies to Jesus. That's Yahweh in the Old Testament in Isaiah 40 and verse 3. So what we're saying here, Jesus has to do with Jehovah. Jehovah saves, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, note this, because I'm going to bring this up to you in the future in your exam. When the word saved is used in the Bible, it doesn't always mean to be rescued or delivered from sin. Have you, ever, have you ever realized that? You can see the word saved or salvation or somebody was saved and it doesn't mean they were saved spiritually from sin. Now, Jesus' name was given by the angel saying, you're going to be, to be naming him this, but let's look at this just a moment, some examples where being saved does not mean being saved from the penalty of sin or the power of sin or the presence of sin. Turn with me to Matthew 8 and verse 25. Matthew 8, 25. Now, this passage is seen in Mark chapter 5, Luke chapter 8, 9, that stretch. They're parallel passages. But when we're looking here at Matthew 8, and we're going to see a, situ a setting here of Matthew 8, 25. And you remember this is going across the sea. And where Jesus calms the storm. And when he was entered into a ship in verse 23, uh, ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, and so much as the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. It says he was in the stern of this, uh, sh this boat, uh, sleeping. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Now, his disciples aren't saying, we need to be forgiven of sin, the penalty of sin. We're not justified. Would you please do that right now? No, this word sozo, and I'm giving you a Greek word that I'm going to show you in other places that does not refer to being saved from the penalty of sin. And this is important for you to remember because you're going to have people come and say, well, what does this mean in 1 Timothy 2.15, that a woman will be saved in childbearing? What does that mean? By faith. Okay. Well, here it is. Save us, we perish. And he saith unto him, why are you fearful? You have little faith. Then he rose, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And they marveled, saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? So they're asking to be saved, but they're being uh, specific. We're perishing. They're be wanting to be delivered from drowning. So this salvation refers to being delivered or rescued from drowning. Now we're going to see in Luke 88, and then I'm going to turn to Luke 8.36 with you. And in Luke 8.36, we see another deliverance. And this has two really that happen in one place that would be using this word sozo, which is usually translated save or salvation or to save someone, but not always. The King James Version, the translators did not always translate it out, but in the Greek text, it's the same word. So in Luke 8.36, we see they also which saw it told them by what means that he was possessed of the devil was healed. 
Now you remember this story of the healing of the Gadarene demoniac came out and met Jesus. There were actually in Mark's gospel, it talks about two uh, in the gospels, uh, the parallel gospels, but healed is the word sozo in the Greek text in verse 36, but it's translated healed. So what do we have here? Healed or saved from demonic possession. This is a salvation, a reference, but it's translated healed. And it's the same Greek word that was, the disciples were crying out in the previous passage we looked at. Then we look down further into another section of this same setting in Mark 5 and verse 34. Turn with me to Mark 5 and verse 34. Not only deliverance from drowning or from demonic possession, but now we see another type of deliverance or salvation occurring or being rescued. And this one has to do with a, a disease, disease. And also later we're going to see death, physical death, not spiritual death but physical death or disease. You remember J Jairus, the leader at the synagogue in Capernaum, and he came to Jesus and said, my daughter's dying, come. She needs to be healed. You, I believe you can. I believe you can heal her. Well, he's come and approached him. And so Jesus is going to go there. And you remember as he's going through the crowd, it was a great press and the woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years said if i could just touch his garment the bottom of his garment if i could just touch him i believe i'd get power and i'd be delivered from this 12 years of an issue of blood that it won't heal and so you see in this passage in reference to it in verse 30 jesus immediately knowing of himself that virtue had gone out of him after she touched him turned him about, and I kind of think this is interesting, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest, who touched me? They're kind of mocking him, and he looked around about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman was fearing and trembling, yes, and knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth, and he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. And that word whole is the same Greek word, sozo, which means salvation to be healed or made whole from a disease, an infirmity. So this is a deliverance from physical disease that Jesus has just performed, and it's salvation, okay? You remember Jonah in the Old Testament? He said, salvation is of the Lord. You know what he's referring to in Jonah chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9 there? He's just been delivered from drowning in the ocean by a whale that took him in and eventually spit him out on the uh, beach. Uh, he was referring to a physical deliverance of his drowning with a seaweed wrapped around his head, and he's not gonna get out of that drowning situation, and a fish came and rescued him. And so he said, salvation is of the Lord. Now we often use that as reference, saving from penalty of sin, but in Jonah's case, delivered from drowning. That's an example of it. Now the next chapter, God delivers Nineveh from the penalty of their sin physical death, the punishment of their sin. But we go on to see whole is the word salvation. So we need to distinguish what kind of deliverance or rescue is the Bible referring to in the context. And we're going to look now in this uh, chapter of Mark 5. And we're going to look at Mark 5 and down to the rest of the chapter, and we see what happened here in this passage. She was made whole that had the issue of blood, but then he went on 
and he was going to go to J Iris's daughter and they said ruler the synagogue she's already died Jesus went there and he says be not afraid only believe so faith is being emphasized and he comes to the house and he says the damsel is not dead but sleepeth in verse 39 and they laughed him to scorn but when he had put them all out he taketh the father and mother of the damsel and then they that were with him and entered in where the damsel was a lying and he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her talitha kumi this is an interesting word talitha that means little girl. It, it's a, the form of this in Aramaic, Talitha, Aramaic language, is like a little lamb. He says, little girl, you're like a little lamb. Arise. I'm telling you, rise up out of death. And right here, it means damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, and she was of age of 12, and they astonished with astonishment, and he charged him straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something be given her to eat. He delivered her from death. You see Jesus resurrecting people. So this is physical death being rescued out of physical death. My wife has a sister, 10 years younger than her. Her name is Trudy. And her first daughter, okay? Victor has three daughters. Well, Trudy has three daughters, but her first daughter is called Talitha. <laughs> they say, that's a term of endearment. I say, little lady, little lamb. And so they named their daughter after this incident, Talitha. And I think that's quite unique. But once again, it reminds us that Jesus rescues from physical death. He saves from physical death. Now, I'm going to turn to another passage, 1 Timothy 2. I had an aunt tell another aunt. They were both religious. One was a Seventh-day Adventist. The other one was kind of an, a British Israelism background. But this one that had many children, I think she had six or seven children. They were all my cousins. What did she say to this one aunt? You're not having any children. You're not going to be saved. And she took this verse, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 15, and put it on her and said, this is why you're not going to go to heaven. You, you can't be saved. He says in verse, it's talking about the place of women in the body of Christ, particularly in the church worship. Women, he says, are not to take authority over men and uh, use, be used as teaching positions over men. That's verse 12. And then verse 15, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, she took this passage and said to my other aunt, Etta, that was her name, Etta, said, you're not going to be saved. You're not, you don't have children. You've had no children of your own, natural children. Is that what this verse is saying? It's by the means of childbearing, you're going to be saved? No. What this saved means here, a woman that's a woman of faith, that is has the characteristics of a true Christian of charity or love and holiness and sobriety. That's the fruits of the spirit showing in a woman that has received Christ and is de has depended upon Christ for, as salvation from the penalty of sin. She's going to be saved through the process of childbearing. Okay, she's going to be delivered from dying. And in the context of the New Testament, many women died in childbearing. They didn't have Victor's wife to minister to them, help in a hospital, right, Victor? <laughs> you know, a lot, many a doctor, many a nurse has rescued people in our civilizations today, women out of possible death during childbearing. My 
second son, my, my, I mean, my second child, his wife has had three cesarean sections or operations in childbearing. She had the first child by natural means of childbirth, but the second one was a preemie baby and she went into premature labor and immediately they had to give C-section. Everyone since then has been by a C-section of their three last children. By the way, my son, Michael, he has four children. He's a pastor in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, uh, and has four children, three boys and one daughter. I didn't finish telling you about my family, my wife, Jeanette, my daughter, Margina, they got those two sons, 13 and 16. She's a Christian school teacher. Her husband's a facilities manager of a large church in our area. And uh, our son, Michael, is a pastor in Calgary, Alberta. And he has three boys and one daughter. And by the way, all of those that I've just named of grandchildren have received Christ now. And I thank the Lord that they've been saved spiritually. They have already trusted Christ. And so they're saved. We could say that. My youngest son is Matthew. He's a, an attorney or what we would call an, a corporate lawyer. Uh, lawsuits between huge corporations. Uh, that's what he does. And he has three children, two boys and a daughter. And he's saved, his wife's saved. And now we know that at least one of his children is saved because she's seven and she's starting to tell the neighbors they need to be saved. And she's witnessing already and telling them that they need to receive Christ as savior. Her neighbor friends that she plays with that are young girls, she's already witnessing to them of Christ. But coming back to this, we want to say this saved here means to be delivered when you're delivering a baby. <laughs> be rescued from physical death. Make it through childbearing is really what he's saying. Hey, there's another one in Timothy here, 1 Timothy 4. Salvation, it starts out with the demons doctrines. In the beginning of this chapter, it talks about forbidding to marry, abstaining from certain Foods, this is like the Catholic Church has done, saying that celibacy is better than marriage and forbidding to marry and forbidding their priest to marry. Uh, th this is the kind of doctrine that is not of God. And it says, Timothy, what I want you to do, and he comes down in verse 15, he says, meditate upon the things I've taught you. Give yourself wholly to them in 1 Timothy 4.15 that th thy profiting may appear to all, take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in the doctrine or the teaching I've given you, for in doing that thou shalt both be saved thyself and them that hear thee. Is Paul saying to Timothy, Timothy, you need to have forgiveness of the penalty of your sin and be justified. No. He's saying being rescued or delivered from false doctrine, not get ensnared with the doctrine of demons, okay? So this is a rescue from false teaching or deliverance from false doctrine. And so the word saved was once again, that word that we talk about sozo, but it means to be rescued. So what I'm saying here, make sure when you use salvation, you clarify to people and clarify to them the context of the passage of scripture, what salvation are we referring to? In conclusion, I would say in the Psalms, many times the psalmist rejoices that the Lord has saved him or redeemed him. What is he saying? Well, in the context, many times it's to be delivered from enemies that are trying to kill him. David is on the run. Saul's after to kill him. And he's been rescued by uh, the Lord physically and not been killed by the enemy. So is that clear to everyone? 
Well, we've gone long, too long already for our break time. Any questions on what we've covered? In the last hour, we're gonna cover uh, four more words besides salvation, and we will get the first page covered in this first lesson. But any of you have a question on what we've covered? If not, let's take about five minutes to have a break, get a drink, and then we'll be back in five minutes. So it will be your time 10 minutes after the hour, I think, won't it? 10 minutes uh, after seven or eight. <laughs> yeah, it'd be 10 minutes after seven, won't it? The first, the first uh, passage that we looked at uh, today, if you remember, was 2 Timothy 3. And that salvation there, though 1 Timothy 2, 15 talks about a woman being rescued or delivered from death as she delivers a baby, that word saved uh, through childbearing or having children, or saved from false doctrine in 1 Timothy 4, 15. Well, in 2 Timothy 3, we come back to that once again in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul, Eunice, and Lois had taught Timothy the scriptures. And in that verse 15, he says, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. And so that salvation there for Timothy is a salvation from the penalty of sin, that's what we usually refer to when we talk about the reason Jesus came, when the angel told Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. That's Matthew 121. We're going to look at some other passages today to conclude the study of salvation. Ephesians 2, we, these are familiar verses. We quote them often, but sometimes I think we miss. In Ephesians 2, it says that God's mercy, God's love, and God's grace have provided for us to be saved. And so he comes in and he says in verse 8, for by grace... Now, grace is a gift, and we'll have that as a word study later on, but just remember, grace is free. It's not a wage. It's not something you earn or deserve. Grace is a gift that Jesus earned for us in what it's referring to. For by grace are you saved. Now, I want to talk about the Greek just a moment because this is important. A lot of people have different beliefs about salvation. Some people believe, yes, you can get saved, but you can lose your salvation. Uh, if you sin and don't confess it, then you lose your salvation is what they believe. That's called the holiness view. And we will talk later about that. that's what Charles and John Wesley of England believed, all right? that you can sin away your salvation. And if you sin and you don't confess it right away, you're no longer saved. Well, this word saved here, notice is a past tense. It has E-D, E-D at the end, saved. That means something that happened in the past, all right? But there are different ways that we talk in English. We have the past tense, we have the present tense, and we have the future tense, all right? And if I said, I lived in Colorado when I was a boy, that would be past tense. Lived, L-E-D, that happened in the past. If I say, I live in Greenville, South Carolina right now, that's present tense. Or if I could, I could put it this way, I'm living in Greenville, South Carolina. That's 
present tense continued action, all right? I'm daily living. And, and there's a Greek tense called the present tense that is continued living, all right? But if I say, I shall live in India, I will live in India next year. Some of you say, come and join us. <laughs> I know what you're going to say, come and join us. But that would be future tense. But Greek has many other tenses. And one of them is called the perfect tense. And the way that you describe a perfect tense, it's you put a period there, like a dot on a piece of paper, and then you draw a line from that period. And it's a continued tense that never, that line never ends. It doesn't stop. It's a continued tense that started in the past someplace and it continues and doesn't end. That's the tense that he uses right here in the Greek when he says, for by grace, are you saved? He said, you are presently saved, but you were saved in the past, ED. Okay, it started in the past. So you got saved at a specific time in your life, all right? But that salvation didn't end or doesn't end. It's continuing. It's a continued line that never stops. Folks, what that's saying is salvation can't be lost. You get God's gift of salvation and it never ends. You can't lose it. Okay, and that's something you got to make clear to people, because if they don't have assurance, and I remember dealing with my mother, after I went off to study my first year in Bible school, I went home to spend that summer time and work a job and try and get money to pay for my next school year. And I was living with my mother and father on the farm and my younger brother. And I wanted to just make sure my mother knew how to be saved. And I asked, Mom, are you saved? She says, well, I once was saved, but I'm not saved any longer. I said, Mom, why are you saying that? Well, I've sinned and I've lost it. My mom didn't understand when a Christian that is saved in the past and can never stop being saved, it's continued tense, can't lose it. You can lose fellowship, but you can't lose salvation. Now, that's something that people need to know. I showed my mom this verse, I believe it was, and I also showed her 1 Peter 1.5. You know what 1 Peter 1.5 says? It says that we Christians are kept by the power of God until the day of salvation or what we would call glorification. Kept by God's power, not our own power, not our own doing. So this is a key passage for by grace, something we didn't deserve to have and can't deserve to keep. You are saved, he says, presently are and past saved through faith, just by depending upon God, not depending upon myself and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. You can't earn it to get it and you can't earn it to keep it not of works, of lest any man should boast. None of us are going to get to heaven and say, God, I did this, this, and this, and I deserve to be in heaven. No, there's no one going to deserve to be in heaven. Christ deserved us to be in heaven. So this is a critical passage about salvation. Titus 2. Would you turn with me to Titus 2 now? We're going to look at this word salvation again, and this is a passage I want you to remember permanently for future reference in an exam. <laughs> Titus 2, verses 11 through 14, give us the three tenses of salvation, all right? It says in Titus 2 and verse 11, for the grace of God that bring us salvation. Once again, it's God's free gift that brings salvation to us. We don't deserve it. We can't deserve to keep it. To bring us salvation hath appeared to all men. So he says this being justified is the past tense. 
it, it grace hath appeared unto us in the past. Verse 14, who gave himself that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Verse 12 is sanctification, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And then the future tense is verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's future when the Lord comes and we're glorified. Now, I'm making a quick reference to that, but I just want you to remember Titus 2, verse 11. Titus 3, look at Titus 3. Once again, this idea of salvation. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve, but showing us his kindness. By his mercy, not giving us what we deserve, he saved us. That's past tense, okay? And he talks about the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs together to the hope of eternal life. So justified. And folks, that's where we're headed next. We're headed to justification. That word justified has just been used in connection to salvation, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I want to talk with you about justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification for us that have received Christ is some, an act of God that happened in the past, okay? He, we, he justified us, all right? We were justified, as it says, by grace in Titus 3 and verse 7. Sanctification, that's another thing that primarily refers to a present part of our salvation. And glorification is the future tense of our salvation that has to do with us being delivered from the presence of sin. So I want to give a definition and some illustrations of justification. You say, what's so important about this? If this is not clear to you as a teacher or preacher, you're not going to make it clear to people that you're ministering to, okay? You need to get this clear to people because lots of religion confuse these things. For example, the Roman Catholics mix justification and sanctification together, don't keep them separate. And it confuses people to where they believe ultimately they have to receive Christ, but then they ultimately get saved by their obeying the Catholic dogma and ceremonies and sacraments and doing certain works. And they're ultimately depending upon their works when it's said and done, because mixing justification and sanctification will do that to you. So you must keep these very much clear apart. And so whenever I sit on an ordination council, you know what an ordination council is? How many of you have been ordained into the ministry? You've gone through an ordination where you were questioned your beliefs and then people that men that were already ordained. Do you do that over there, Victor? Do you guys have ministerial pastoral ordination? Victor? Do you? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. When I sit on a council, this is what I do. I ask them, uh, would you give me a definition of justification, a clear, concise definition? Then after the, if they do that, then I will ask the, the, the candidate for ordination, is sanctification an act or a process? And so I ask them to clarify, is it an act or a process? 
And then uh, after they deal with that, and if they get it right, that's good. If they don't get it right, because I'm asking them a trick question on that one, because sanctification is an act and it is a process both. But I ask it in such a way, they have to be clear in their mind what it is or they'll answer it. Well, maybe an act or maybe a process. No, it's a both an act and a process. But then I will ask them, what does glorification deliver us from or save us from or rescue us from? So think about this a moment, how you would answer these questions. And now we're gonna go into the definitions. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for answering that. Okay, justification is to be declared righteous. If you wanna remember one thing, it's to be declared righteous by God himself. Now, does that mean made righteous? Inwardly, what we would call the imparting of righteousness? No, it's the imputing of righteousness. And there's a difference between imputing righteousness or God imparting righteousness. So we want to look at this definition. Justification is the legal act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner not guilty or liable for punishment of sin. So you can put one word for that whole phrase, and that's pardon. To be declared not guilty or pardoned, P-A-R-D-O-N. And you're going to see that later. It's a legal pardon, okay? But so not liable for the punishment and then the second part of justification, God not only declares the believing sinner pardoned, but he places on the believer's spiritual account, a bank account, if we could put it that way, a spiritual bank account, the what? Righteousness of Jesus Christ. So this is an exchange. He takes and he made Jesus to be sin for us, as 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says. He hath made him to be sin for us. So he gives Jesus the punishment of our guilt. And we're now forgiven and pardoned. We're no longer considered to be guilty or liable for punishment before God. But then he gives us Christ's righteousness that he earned for us the very righteousness of Christ. So God sees us legally. We're talking about a judicial court of law setting before God, the judge. God declares us as righteous as Christ is. Okay, legally as righteous as Jesus Christ. So he gives us Christ's righteousness. It's an exchange really that happens. It's a legal pardon and a placement or imputation of legal righteousness to someone that's receiving Christ as Savior. It deals with the penalty of sin, not the power or practice of sin or the presence of sin in our lives. It's simply dealing with one thing, and that's penalty of sin. It takes care of our deserved penalty of punishment, and it gives us the righteous standing of Christ. So you remember Abraham, he had done nothing righteous. He was a pagan, an idolater that God had called to leave his land and go to a place he had never seen. And he comes to a point in Genesis 15. And if you wanna turn there, this is the first time we see in the Bible that it clearly says that God declared someone righteous in his sight, legally declaring Abraham this way. And you remember in Genesis 15, God told him, I'm going to make you have children. You and your wife, Sarah, are going to be having children, and they are going to be in number as great as the sands of the sea and the stars of heaven in number. And and so Abraham heard God say that, 
And it says in verse five of Genesis 15, when he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he says, your descendants are gonna be innumerable, unable to be counted. And it says about Abraham, and he believed on the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So it put it on his spiritual bank account. You're righteous. So Abraham believed the power and the promise of God. And it was counted on him for righteousness. Now, the question comes about, how does that apply to us today, believing the power and promises of God? Well, we're going to see it in the passage that we're going to turn to in Romans chapter 4. I just recently taught our, my Sunday school class at our church that I teach at 11 on Sundays, how to witness to Mormons. Mormons believe that you can become a god. Literally, that man has the potential of becoming a god with his own kingdom, his own world, his own Jesus, his own Satan. And that's a baffling thought. And that's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But the passage I use to try and witness to Mormons is Romans 4 and James 2. James 2 says, faith without works is dead. And that's before man's eyes. But this is in Romans 4, before God's eyes, who sees inside the heart. In Romans 4, verse 1, what shall we say then? Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. Now, Mormons, or the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints, believe they're Jews in America. They'll tell you the tribe they even belong to. Really strange. So that's why I bring up Abraham, because he's the father of the Jews. For if Abraham were justified, okay, if he were declared righteous before God by works, he hath whereof to glory. He could glory, but not before God. God wouldn't accept that. God wouldn't say, yes, I, I glory in the fact that you're justified by your works. No, you are guilty by your works. You have bad works, okay? For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace or a free gift, but of a debt, earning it, a wage. And he's saying a grace and debt are mutually exclusive. They're opposites. They're polar opposites. They're as far as the North Pole is from the South Pole on this earth. But to him that worketh not, he's not trying to earn righteousness, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So depending upon God's power and promise gets righteousness. How do I know that? Look down here at the end of the chapter. And you want to remember this. This is Abraham now unable to have children naturally and his wife unable. She's an old woman. He's an old man. In verse 19, it says, being not weak in faith, he, that is Abraham, considered not his own body now dead when he was a hundred, about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, past childbearing age. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. God promised, I'm going to give you, so he believed him, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able. He had power to perform it. So he's believing in the promise and power of God. And therefore, it was imputed. It was put on his legal spiritual bank account to him for righteousness. That's Genesis 15, 6. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him that he got righteousness, but for us also present day people to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that what? Raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead. That's the power of God that we put our faith in. Jesus is a resurrected savior 
who was delivered for our offenses. He brings the pardon. He took the punishment of our offenses on the cross when he died. And he was raised again for our justification. That's another form of justified. So what we're talking about is how do we get justified today before God? We believe God promises that through Jesus, who died to pay for our sins, he took care of the penalty or the pardon of our sins, and he raised him from the grave. So he has power to give us righteousness or justification to declare us because Jesus came out of the grave. He had accepted Jesus' resurrection as a stamp of approval that he accepted his sacrifice. So here it is. I want to just say this. Abraham had not served God, but believed in the power and promises of God. So it was counted to him for righteousness. And then we go on in Romans 4, and we see Abraham had not worked, but we see David who had bad works. In verse 6 of Romans 4, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, Psalm 32 and are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute, put on his spiritual bank account, guilty of sin. Cometh this blessedness upon them that are circumcised, that they've gone through a ceremony, a religious ceremony, only upon the uncircumcised, that's Jews, no, also Gentiles, all right? For we say that faith was reckoned to God for righteousness. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision? No, Abraham was declared righteous actually about 16 to 18 years before he got circumcised. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So he uses David, who was a murderer, an adulterer, who had bad works, He got righteous by believing in God's forgiveness through his power and promise. Abraham came out of a false religion, but he hadn't done works for God. And so God justified him by belief and faith. So we want to think in terms of Isaiah 53. Uh, Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. And it says, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And he says, my righteous servant shall justify many. Look at that sometime when you look at Isaiah 53 in your study of what we've looked at. And it talks about the righteous servant, Jesus Christ, justifying many. Galatians 2.16 is where we want to end today on this part of justification. Let's turn to Galatians 6, I mean 2, verse 16. Both Paul in Romans and Paul in Galatians is fighting legalism. And legalism is thinking by the, the works I do, I will be justified before God. Now, we see in verse 16, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Yes, that's in verse 16 of chapter 3. So it doesn't say seeds, but seed, and it's in Christ. So when we go back over to Galatians 2 and verse 16, it says, knowing that a man is not justified, declared righteous, by the works of the law, trying to obey or do what the law commands. You know, the Jews had in the Old Testament 613 commands. How would you like to keep all of those? <laughs> I, but most of us don't even have the ability to remember the Ten Commandments, let alone remember all 613. He says, you're not going to get the righteous before God by trying to obey the law's commands, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed on Jesus or in Jesus that 
we might be justified by the faith of Jesus and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh, no human being be justified. And I've wrote, written in my Bible, Acts 13, 39 through 42, next to that, because that's a parallel passage to this verse, Acts 13, 39 through 42. Now, C.H. Spurgeon gives an illustration about this. He says there was the godly Dr. Archibald Alexander of Princeton University had been a preacher of Christ for 60 years and a professor of divinity for 40. On his deathbed, he was heard to say to a friend, all my theology is reduced into this narrow compass. This one thing, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And it's Jesus that saves us sinners from the penalty of our sin and gets us righteousness before God. Now, Thiessen's book says in it, and you'll see this under justification. In Thiessen's book, it says, in regeneration, uh, one receives a new life and a new nature. But in justification, he gets a new standing legally before God. It's an exchange of my guilt for Christ's righteousness. Abraham, David, the Philippian jailer, all of them are examples of this. But I want to uh, give the final illustration of this today. Have you ever heard of Martin Luther? How many of you could raise your hand and say, yeah, I've, I've heard of Martin Luther. Okay, Victor, I see that. Martin Luther was a Augustinian monk for the Catholic Church, the 1500s. He was a very devout Catholic monk trying to do everything perfectly that he was told he had to do. But Martin Luther had a very sensitive conscience and he was always going to a priest that was over him, the father confessor, they called him, and confessing sins. Because in order to get forgiven in the Catholic church, you've got to confess to a priest and the priest has to declare you forgiven. See, they don't go to Christ, the mediator, and ask, for his blood to cleanse them from all sin, even after they believe they've received Christ, they go to a priest and a priest is supposed to have power to, well, this priest kept having Martin Luther come confessing this little thing, that little thing, because his conscience was so sensitive. He got tired of hearing Martin Luther confess this and that. And he says, I'm gonna get that guy's eyes off of himself. He's only thinking about his conscience and himself. I'm going to assign him to teach other monks here at the University of Wittenberg, the Book of Romans. And if he gets to teaching others, he'll get his eyes off of himself and be thinking about others, what he's got to tell them. That was a mistake that that priest made for the Catholic Church. Because when Martin Luther began to study the Book of Romans so that he could teach the Book of Romans to other monks, you know what happened? He saw the term righteousness. Now, my life's verse is Romans 1 16. For I am not for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Okay, that's my life's verse, personally, Romans 1, 16. Not because I always practice it, but so it encourages me not to be ever ashamed of Christ, but witness. Okay, that's why I have that as my life verse. Well, 
Martin Luther saw that phrase as he was studying chapter one. He said, oh, the righteousness of God, he's so holy and righteous, and I'm so unrighteous. And he started going into introspection. Later on, he saw the righteousness of God, and he came to realize that righteousness referred to God as always fair and just. He treats people equally without partiality. He always is fair and just. And that's the righteousness of God. But later in chapter three of Romans, the Holy Spirit showed him the righteousness of God was a gift from God. It wasn't God's moral character as righteousness that condemned him. It wasn't his God's fairness that was always just. But in Romans three, he began to see that the righteousness was by grace and it was a gift that God wanted to give him. And boy, when he saw that, he said, by faith in the good news that Jesus died for me and paid for the penalty of my sin, I can be righteous before God. And by faith, he received the gift of justification, the righteousness of God. He became justified. And you know what happened? He began to teach that to others. And that was contrary to the doctrine of the Roman church. That's why we have the Protestant churches today. He protested what the Catholics were teaching. The Protestants were protesters of false teaching that you had to ultimately be saved by keeping the works required of you in the Catholic church. And that started the Reformation, and that's when then Zwingli and John Calvin and others followed teaching accurately how to be justified by Christ alone, by faith alone, through grace alone, by scripture alone, by Jesus alone. Okay, now, are you clear about justification? It's a legal act. It happens at a specific time. All right. Now, how about sanctification? Is it an act or a process? Well, sanctification is both. It's an act. If you look at 1 Peter 1, let's turn to 1 Peter 1. And we see it says in verse 2, he's addressed them as those who were in foreign countries as Jews, he says, you're elect in verse two, according to the foreknowledge of God, the father, through sanctification of the spirit. Now there's sanctification unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So we see the Trinity in this one verse, God, the father elected us according to foreknowledge, the spirit gave us sanctification or sanctify us, set us apart for obedience, and then the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the act of God when the Holy Spirit, when we believe upon Christ and his shed blood, that God sets us apart. It's the act of God setting us apart as justified sinners that have just received Christ setting us apart exclusively to be the possession of God. We are now his property. We belong to him. That's what it means to be set apart as his property. You know, in India, I needed a new charger cord for my phone. Now, Jim Starr needed a new phone, and Victor took us over to the mall where we could get the stuff we needed while we were there. Now that charger cord that I got works well for my phone. It, it, the other one was old, it was seven years old and it was worn out. But this cord is mine, it belongs to me, I paid for it, okay? And it, nobody else owns that cord, it's exclusively mine. That's exactly what this word sanctified, set apart as God's possession, no one else owns us. He's our owner, he possesses us. That's sanctification act. But 
he also sets us apart from the power and practice of sin. Now, remember that justification had to do with the penalty of sin. Now we're talking about the habits of sin and the power of the practice of sin in the believer's life. So sanctification is a process of God giving us power over the power of sin and the practice of sin. It deals with the practice of sin while justification deals with the penalty of sin. You know, Paul has a prayer that he prays in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. You want to turn there with me? At the end of that passage of scripture, he keeps talking about the second coming in every chapter of Paul's 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, the second coming of Christ is made reference to. So it says in verse 23, and this is the prayer of Paul for them, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it has to do with the second coming of Christ. He's saying, I, I'm praying that God will be setting you apart from the penalty of sin, but one day totally blameless. That's glorification, okay? But he references the process of sanctification in this prayer. God's gonna be setting you apart in mind, body, and soul, the whole man by sanctification. So what we're talking about here is the act of God at conversion to set us apart as his possession exclusively. But presently, the, uh, we, he is in a process of replacing old sin habits with righteous new habits in our lives. That's what we see in Ephesians 4 and 5 and Colossians 3. The put off and put on, put off this, this sin habit lying and replace it with telling the truth. He says, put off stealing and replace it with going to work and earning money to give to others. He says, put off corrupt communication and replace it with words that build others people up and minister grace to the hearers. And he goes through sin habits and he said, put this off and replace them. That's the process of sanctification, putting off and putting on. So we call that sanctification. I remember when my wife and I were first getting married, we got engaged in August of 1973. We've had 48 years of wonderful marriage. And uh, we, I had to buy her the ring when we didn't have much money. And I paid $330 for her engagement and wedding ring. And she had $250 and she bought us a car for $250. <laughs> it was 10 years old. It, it, it didn't look very good. It needed real lot of help. You know, some of you, you drive cars like that, don't you? That they, they, They're old and worn and don't look so great. Well, it had one door that was a different color from the rest of the car. The paint job wasn't good on the rest of the paint, but it looked really odd with a different, totally different colored door. I think it was blue and the rest of the car was brown. You know, it, it probably needed new tires and it needed to have some new spark plugs and things like that. Well, we bought it as it was. It's ours. We own it. Okay. We've set it apart as our, but I go to work on it. And I had a mechanic Christian friend. He helped me put new spark plugs, set the timing on it. You know, no doubt we had to get new tires. Hey, we were in a process of putting off the old. We repainted the door and the whole body. We put off that old paint job and replaced it with a new paint job. Hey, that's a process of sanctifying a car, all right? It was getting better and better. And so that's an illustration I would use, put off and put on. 
And so that's what Romans 6 talks about. When we talk about Romans 6 through 8, that's where Paul deals with sanctification a lot. The first five chapters of the book of Romans primarily deal with justification. The need for justification, you're sinners, and this is what you idolaters and sinful people look like, and you need to be saved, and you're guilty before the law, and through Christ, you can be justified. But when we come to Romans 6, he's been talking about grace that forgives sin. And so he comes and he says in verse 6, chapter 1 of verse 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So God's forgiving grace will look big and be abound. And he says, how that we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Start changing. The process of changing and growing out of sin habits to righteous habits. And so that's what chapter six is all about. End of verse chapter seven. You remember in chapter seven that uh, he comes down there and he says, the things that I would do, I don't do them. I've got a nature inside of me that keeps me from doing what I'd like to do as a Christian. And he says, the things that I wouldn't do, I find myself doing them. There's a law or a a, a principle of sin nature in me that causes me to do the things I don't want to do. And Paul, even though he's saved or justified, he's experienced justification. This process of sanctification is a battle. It's a war. It's an ongoing war. It's not easy. But notice what he says in verse 23 of Romans 7. But I see another law in my members, in my body, warring against the law of my mind, my spirit that wants to do right, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, or that principle, or, or that power of sin, which is in my members. And here's his exclamation. And we all feel this as believers, as justified, saved people we that are set apart for God, his possession. We many times feel this. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? Guess what? This is a rescue he's wanting. Who will deliver me from the body of death? And he calls his oh sin nature, a body of death dominated by sin. He doesn't stop there, though. Look at what he says. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I, so he says, Jesus Christ is going to deliver me. Sanctification is by the power of Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. Our identification with Christ and the power of a resurrected Savior enabling us. You know what the illustration that they would think of here in Romans 7 in the New Testament times? If a person murdered someone in the Roman Empire, you know what the penalty was for a, a non-Roman for that? The penalty for murdering someone is the person you murdered. Let's say you uh, uncircumcised Gentile, not Roman citizen, you murdered another non-Roman citizen, the punishment was they would take the dead corpse or body and they would tie it to you face to face, arm to arm, and you would be facing that body tied to it permanently until it rotted off of you. You would have to carry that body stinking with maggots and corruption and bacteria in it. And you, you, if anyone dared to try and cut you loose from what the Roman government had done, they would have threat of their life doing it, so nobody would cut you loose, and you would have to have it go. That's how Paul felt about his sin nature that was still there, corrupt sin nature still in him. Oh, a body of death. I've got this body tied to me, and I can't get freedom. Who's going to free me? And he says, oh, I thank Jesus Christ. 
my Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. He said, the power of Christ is going to get me freer and free of it. And one day, totally free, cut free from this body of death or sin nature, glorification. And so it's a process, but I want to come today and I want to try and get into glorification here just a bit and then we'll close. All right. Glorification. Compare glorification to justification. Justification it delivers us or rescues us from the penalty of sin. Sanctification delivers us from the practice or power of the habits of sin. But glorification delivers us from the presence of sin. What Jesus is going to do is cut this oh sin nature free of us, totally from our body, our spirit, our minds, totally rescued at his coming, the second coming of Christ. So next week that we get together, we're going to finish glorification and adoption, all right? But we've got a foundation, I think, laid here today, all right? Any questions or comments? Yes, sir, here. Yes, Min yes, Ding? Uh, what is the difference between the safe and the salvation? Okay, I'm going to have to turn up my uh, speaker here and get a little better sound. I, my sound is not coming real good from you. Uh, all right, now go ahead, Min Ting. Uh, what is the difference between the safe and the salvations? Are they are one? Of what kind of salvation did you say? A definition? That are safe and salvations between different, between different safe and salvation. Saved and salvation, what's the difference? Yeah. yeah. They, they come from the same re, root word or Greek root word. Soteriology, uh, soteria has to do with the idea of salvation. Sozo means to save. And so they're coming from the same root in the Greek. And there's not a difference. Salvation is a, a possession. It's a noun, okay? So I have salvation. That means I possess something. A person, place, or thing is a noun, all right? Okay. So, to, but whenever we say save someone, that's a verb. That's an action. So when God saved us, that was an action he took. And from that action of him, when he saved us, we now have salvation, which is a noun, which means a, we have a state of being, a thing, a gift, the gift of salvation. All right. Is that what you're trying to figure out? And one more question. I have not clarified with uh, that idea. Uh, you say that save is a uh, Pass, right? Yeah, there's there's when three the pass, there's three. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, MNP. If when when a person's safe now, when uh, some people are praising uh, uh, praising the uh, the gospel outside the world and uh, uh, outside the street, but if they at the moment they save or the support, if is that uh, say, uh, safe by already by the past? In the bus, we can oh, their we can past sins. The yeah. yeah, you're talking about the penalty of their past sins yeah. taken care of when they ask uh, God to save them. Okay, let, let me let me give you this. There's a good verse that I think helps. Romans five eight is good for this one because uh, when I got saved. Okay, I'll give you my own testimony as an illustration. I was 10 and a half years old, February 22nd, 1959. Okay, I was 10 and a half years old. That's the day that I said, God, I don't care what anybody in this church thinks about me. I want to be saved. And in my heart, I cried out to the Lord. Now, I went forward and I talked to the pastor and he showed me some scriptures and prayed with me, but I made the decision in my heart to take Christ as my savior that moment. 
So that's when I was born again, given new life and justified in God's sight, because I came to believe by faith upon Jesus Christ. So now at that time, I had committed certain past sins, disobeyed my parents, lied. The penalty of all that sin was taken care of. The sins I committed that day, resisting God before I yielded to God, I was saying, God, you're not going to make me go forward and be ashamed of all of those people. I was fighting God. That sin was wrong. But all my future sins were taken care of that day legally in the court of God, because when Jesus paid for my sins, they were all future. He took care of my past, my present, and my future sins penalty. Okay. And that's okay. Does that that's and so it's so Romans 5 8 says, God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay, we were still in the state of sin, but that was what Paul was saying about his time. So past, present, or future sins, it's all taken care of. Jesus paid the penalty on the cross. When he said, it is finished, that word to stelestai on, uh, in the Aramaic, when it, it, we see it is finished, that's the last thing Jesus said, it is finished. That literally means paid in full. He paid the full penalty, the full debt of all of our sins, past, present, and future. So when we come to get saved, we're not just asking for past sins to be forgiven the penalty of. We're coming and getting the total package of all sins I've committed or ever will commit forgiven. The penalty. Okay? So... It's a... An excellent suite of predestination, right? It means what? It, it's uh, connect, uh, connect destinations. Or well, it's talk about the predestinations. Yeah, he bestowed upon us total salvation, a penalty of sin. Okay. I, I mean, uh, predestinations. Pre predestination? Yeah. Uh, we'll Is get it, into pre predestination. Yeah. Okay, we'll talk about predestination uh, next week uh, from that standpoint, uh, because predestination has to do with God predetermining something in the future, okay? But it's not referring just necessarily to the penalty of our sin, and we'll get you the context of Ephesians 1, Lord willing, uh, the 22nd of this month, all right? Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll go into that. That's a topic in itself, and we don't have time to go into that today, brother. Okay? But you're thinking. That's good, Min Thing. That's good. Anything else? Okay, that's good. That's a good concept that you brought out. The, let, let's, I'll give you a closing illustration. Let's say that you and I only sin three times a day in thought, attitude, and action. Now, I still, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer, but I still have worry. Sometimes I get angry when I shouldn't. That's sin, all right? My heart attitude, okay? We're not just talking about our actions, but our thoughts, our attitudes, our, we, we put our emotions in the wrong and we do things wrong. But if, let's just say for three, three times a day, all my life, I commit three sins a day. Okay, each year, that's going to be about a thousand sins. Okay. Now I'm 73 getting ready to turn 74. So that means I've committed 73,000 sins at three a day. Okay. Now, what did Jesus pay for? Did he pay for 73,000 of my sins, or am I going to live 10 more years? Did he pay for those 10,000 sins that I may commit? I don't want to sin. I'm like Romans 7. Oh, I wish I'd do the things I, I want to do, but I don't always do that to please God. What about those? Well, when Jesus paid for all my sins, 
let's say I'm going to live to be 85 and die. He paid for 85,000 sins penalty, legally paid the full payment of the punishment of my sins that they deserve. So I wouldn't have to pay for any of them in the life hereafter. He took care of them all. Now, the Catholics, what do they believe? You, you got to go pay for some in purgatory after you die. Even though you're, you might make it not that going to have to go to hell and pay for eternity, you could be even a saint in their ways of terming a saint, and you'd still have to go to purgatory. And they've got people praying to burning candles and paying money to the Catholic Church to help pay off some of those sins so you don't have to spend extra years in purgatory so you can eventually go to heaven. That's work salvation. That's not Jesus that did it. There's a good phrase by a book that says, not do, but done. Not do, D-O, but done, D-O-N-E. When it comes to the penalty of our sins, Jesus has already done it. He's paid for it in full. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Doesn't that make you rejoice to think I'll never have to worry about purgatory or any punishment? Now, we in our time will later on, we'll talk about the difference between sonship and fellowship, because that's what people confuse. Sonship and fellowship. We'll talk about that later. All right, good. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to try next time get the light a little better so you can see my wrinkles in my face, <laughs> the age. <laughs> uh, but it's been good to be with you. Uh, Victor, anything you want to say in closing? Or, or do we close in prayer? Or you want to close in prayer? Or... Uh, it's, everything is your part. It is your glass. Everything is your part, beginning to the end. It is your glass. Okay, so I, <laughs> Okay. Well, all right. Uh, Min Thing, why don't you close us in prayer today? Okay, let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this day. You have given us once again the class. Lord, we have love, learned many things from our teachers. Lord, bless him and guide him mm. through your Holy Spirit so that he can come with us with a true knowledge and in the next class, Lord. Thank you for everything. All these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good. Well, it's been good to meet with you and look forward.